True! Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I am mad? The disease has sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled. Above all, the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how the first idea entered my brain, but once conceived it haunted me day and night. Object, there was none. Passion. There was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me an insult. For his gold, I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had an eye of a vulture, a pale blue, with film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold so many degrees very gradually. I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and rid myself of the eye forever. Now, this is the point. You fancy me mad. A madman know nothing, but you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded with the caution. With foresight, with dismutilation, I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man during this whole week before I killed him. And every night, at about midnight, I turned the latch on his door and opened it. Oh, so gradually. And then, when I had made the opening sufficient enough for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, so that no light shone out. And then I thrust my head, oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my head, my whole head within the opening, for that I could see him lay upon his head. Ha! Would a madman been so wise at this? And then, when my head was well in the room, I undid the lantern curiously, oh so curiously, curiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so a single ray fell on the vulture's eye. And this I did for seven long minutes, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye was always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it had nothing to do with the old man. But the eye, the evil eye who vexed me. And every morning when the day broke, I boldly went into his chambers and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he passed the nights previous. So, you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night just at twelve I looked upon him while he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious at opening the door. A minute's watch hand moved more quickly than mine did. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers of my own sanctity. I could secretly contain my own triumphs and feelings. To think that there was a opening in the door little by little, not even a dream of the secretest deeds I thought. I fairly chuckled at this idea. Perhaps he heard me, for he moved out of the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now, you may think that I drew back, but no, oh no, his room was black, pitch black, with the thick darkness, for the shutters were closed and fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door, and I kept pushing it steadily, oh so steadily. I had my hand in, and I was about to open the lantern, when my thumb slipped on the fastening, and the old man sprang out of the bed crying, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing for an hour. A whole hour I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done night after night, hearkening to death as he watches the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan. And I knew it. A groan of mortal terror. It was a groan of pain or grief. Oh no! It was a low, stilfed sound that arise from the bottom of the soul, overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many, 
a night, just at midnight when all the world slept, it had welled up my own bones, deepening with its dreadful echoes, the terrors that just distracted me. I say I knew it well, oh, I knew what the old man felt, and I pitied him, although I chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise. When he had turned to bed, his fears had been growing ever so growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy himself clueless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it's nothing. It's but the wind in the chimney. It's, it's a mouse crawling across the floor, or it's a merely a cricket who made a single chirp. Yes, he had been trying to comfort himself with those circumstances, with the circumstances, but he found it all in vain, all in vain, because death in approaching had stroked with his black shadow before him, and had enveloped him, the victim, and knew the mournful influence that unprescribed shadows that caused him to feel, although he had never seen nor heard to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very, very little crevice of the canter, and so I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, how stealthily, until the length of a simple, dim ray, like a thread of a spider, shot out the crevice of the fall fall out of the crevice and fall upon the vulture's eye. It was open, it was wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect disgust. All the dull blue, with all the hideous velvet over. It chilled me to the very marrow of my bones, but I could not see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had distracted the ray, as if in for I had retracted the ray as if instinct precisely on the damn spot. And have I not told you that you've mistake for madness, but over acuteness of the sense? Now I say there come my ears a low, dull, quick sound the watch makes when it envelops the cotton. I knew that sound too well. It was the beating of the old man's heart, it increased with my fury, it was beating the drum as it stimulates to a soldier into courage. But even yet I reframed and I kept still, secretly breathed. I held the lantern motionless, I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime. The hellish tattoo of the heart increased, and it grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder with every instant the man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder with every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you I am nervous. So, I am. And now, with the dead of the hour of night, amid... The dreadful silence of the house. So strange a noise this excited me. It's uncontrollable terror. Yet, for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder and louder. I thought the heart must burst, and now the anxiety seized me. The sound would have been heard by the neighbor. The old man's hour had to come. With a loud yell, I threw open the lantern and leaped into the room. He shrieked once and only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him and smiled gaily to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with the muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for many minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took 
for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head, the arms, and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scan legs. I then replaced the board so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught all. (laughs) When I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock. Still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I now to fear? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office. And they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search. Search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure undisturbed. In the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought them chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues, while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness, until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, and yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. Much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I I arose and argued about trifles in a high key, and with violent gesticulations, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides, as if excited to furry the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and grated it upon the boards with the noise of rows over, all over, and continually increased. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no. They heard, they suspected it. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought, and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this decision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now, again, hark! Louder! 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 Villains! I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It is the beating.
of his hideous heart. <laughs>